Is Bo Nix a quality starting quarterback in the National Football League? There's some that project he's going to be. And for the Minnesota Vikings, there's going to be a lot of talk about them selecting Bo Nix in the first round of the NFL draft. What do I think? I think a lot of you already know. But we're going to dive into the enigma that is Bo Nix, Oregon quarterback here on Skull Search. Real Porno Show, hosted by Tyler Bornis. The managing editor of USA Today's Vikings Wire. Writer for the College Football Network. Publisher of Substack Run In Shooter. Host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungry. On the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. As well as a founding member of Vikings First and Skull. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Skull Search. I'm your host, Tyler Fornis. With me, as always, is producer Dave. We're talking about the enigma that is Bo Nix here today. And he's a very interesting one. Uh, As you know, he played the last two years at Oregon and spent a lot of time at Auburn. And there are a lot of mixed opinions on him. And it's going to be very interesting to see how his NFL career will actually progress. But let's talk about the prospect right now. Uh, he's 6'2", 217, fifth-year senior. He was a four-slash-five-star recruit, depending on what uh, recruiting uh, service that you like to look at. Uh, and he spent those first three years at Auburn. And he, in, in turn, has the most starts of any quarterback in the history of college football. That is potentially going to change with the advent of the playoff. And 12 game seasons, plus you also have the conference championship game for the majority of these conferences. So when you look at everything, eh, he has it for now, and it's still a very impressive number, but that could end up changing. So overall in his career, he uh, completed 66.2% of his passes, almost 15,000 yards, 108 touchdowns, 20 interceptions, also carried the ball for 1,607 yards and 38 touchdowns on the ground. I've watched a lot of Bo Nix live. I watched a good amount of film earlier uh, before the season, and I finished off everything with Texas Tech in both Washington games here this year. Now, Nix is going to be a very polarizing prospect because he ran this offense to peak efficiency. And one thing you have to do with college offenses is you have to contextualize. Why are they being asked to do this? And within the context of that, how successful are they? And can they grow and do more that these are the questions you have to ask yourself with college, because some people like to put their players in situations where they can continue to grow and develop others put their players in situations because they want to win college games and they don't really bother so much with the pro development. So you have to ask yourself a lot of those questions and try to nail down what he is or isn't good at and why the offense was built the way it was. So with Nick's, it's interesting because he was very successful in this Oregon offense. It was also one that was designed specifically to mask all of his flaws and his flaws are, I don't see him as a really great processor. I don't see him as a guy who can drive the ball down the field consistently. And he still has that little bit of a bozo gene where if he senses any kind of pressure, like like the phrasing that they use in the football world, if you see color, you run. So that what they mean by that is if you see the other opponent's jersey color, you bail and you try to make a play. And we saw that I was watching Drake May the other night and you saw a little bit of that from him. And it got better as time went on with Knicks. It's also gotten better, but he still does it. And he does it in this way that is more harm than good. So you saw it in the Pac-12 championship game against Washington. He saw the the opponent's jersey cross in front of him and he bailed and he does like that. It's it's almost like it should be set to Benny Hill music where he just runs around and then he trips and it's like a 20 yard sack. Not great. It's not something you want to see. That's improved. That was a very common occurrence at Auburn. So he gets all the credit for that, but he's just not the guy to be able to operate a offense. that's not just a point and shoot. Um, and let's kind of go over some of the good and the bad because there is good things about Bo Nix, but it's the context of why they're good and why the bad uh, kind of partners in that you can really get the full picture of why I don't care for him. Um, 
when he everything is clean and i think this is important because when everything is clean um he he plays really well and when you look at how he plays when the pocket is clean like we talked about this with kirk cousins consistently when cousins had a clean pocket oh he can hit anything he can hit it with consistency he can hit it with accuracy he can do a lot of different things but when it's not clean those are the issues that you have so he throws a nice deep ball with touch and placement. And I'm going to talk about arm strength because I don't believe in his arm that much. When you talk about a deep ball, Teddy Bridgewater threw a great deep ball. You can throw it with distance. Distance does not signal arm strength. And here's why. Almost every quarterback in the NFL can throw a ball 60 yards. It, that should be easy for them. But can they throw a 15-yard deep out from the opposite hash at the top of their drop? And can they hit it with power, precision, and accuracy? That shows true arm strength. Fitting the ball in a tight window shows true arm strength. Those gunslinger type throws. Like uh, the one I like to point to a lot is 2018 when Kirk Cousins hit Adam Thielen uh, at Lambeau Field to tie the game. That was arm strength. That's the kind of stuff you want to see. Anybody can throw with distance. Can you throw with power? And I don't believe Knicks can throw that well with power. And one of the examples I have is guys who can throw with power can go across their body and like in the, like jumping and Knicks did one of those against Oregon state. And that sucker died. It died hard. And the receiver had to come back like five to 10 yards to go get the football. That doesn't signal a lot of arm strength, but that's also not really a throw you're going to see in the NFL. But when you see opportunities like that to really test out arm strength, I don't think he passes the test. Um, let's continue on with the positives though, because look, I, I just don't like Bonex, but I, I want to be fair in this evaluation. All right. He does not get sacked much and he only took six sacks in 2023 in nine of the uh, games that he played in nine to 14, a total of zero sacks. Pretty impressive. Uh, you usually see quarterbacks in an offense that, that throws with any form of decent amount, they're going to get sacked. It's kind of just a fact of life playing quarterback, but Knicks did not. And he deserves some credit there. He yeah, is. A how dual- much of that was competition? Oh, the, this is the best year. The PAC 12 has had in forever. Um, the PAC 12, like it's not a historically great defensive conference, but they weren't scrubs. Like he played Washington twice. Washington went to national championship game. Um, USC had one of their better defensive performances against Oregon this year. uh, They didn't play Arizona. They played Arizona state and Arizona state. They played hard. Like we're talking, we're talking about um, a conference that played well. Texas tech has a relatively good defense. They're not great, but they're, they're solid. They, and they played them in non-conference. So I would not look at the competition and say it's competition based. I mean, if he played in the SEC, he probably doubles that number, but even 12 sacks is it's fine. Like I, I don't have an issue with that. I think considering all things involved, six sacks is a very impressive number for Knicks. Uh, he's also a dual threat. He can be a, both elusive and a dynamic weapon on the ground. He, uh, this year you only ran for 250 yards and six touchdown, but it's, not, not just about running the football. It's about escaping pressure. And he was able to do that with consistency this year in the pocket and evade rushers when they came at him and then make plays down the field. So there are positive things. Um, he did set the NCAA record for accuracy uh, uh, completion percentage this year. He beat out Mac Jones by, I think, 0.1. Now, Mac Jones hasn't exactly had NFL success either. So this is why stats don't always tell the whole story and you have to dive into the context of why. And the context will be told with the film. All right. So now let's, let's talk about why I don't believe in him. I believe the offense is structured specifically to eliminate everything bad and accentuate the good. And I don't think that translates to the NFL. Here's why his average depth of target was 6.9 yards. You're doing a lot of screens and a lot of super quick game because you don't trust Bo Nix to go off of that first read. And that's why I don't view him very highly. Now you have guys who do a lot of quick game in college college. You do some explosive passing college. There's a ton of quick game. Why spacing 
athletes and lack of quality offensive linemen all play a factor in this. In college football, trenches really win because when you have great trench play, you can really take advantage of a lot of things. So when you're looking at Bo Nix, that 6.9 uh, average depth of target is really bad. For context, Drake May has a career average depth of target average of 10.7 yards, nearly four yards more. And they do a ton of quick game at North Carolina. As I said earlier, I just watched him there. They do a lot of quick game. So to me, it's not like, that's a big red flag. Why is he doing a lot of quick game? Um, he like to pair with that. He had seven. Uh, sorry. He had two games at four and a half and one game at 4.3 yards, average depth of target. That's alarming. And it's because they don't trust him to do much more. They're trusting him. It's like a one read and a lot of stuff is pre-snap. So with college, if you see a certain look, if you see a single high safety against uh, a certain formation, guess what? You're just going to be like, all right, three-step drop, throw the deep uh, go route. And that's it. You do a lot of this stuff pre-snap. They're not trusting him post-snap. And that's a problem. It, it's a problem because when you get to the NFL, you're not going to be able to have that confidence that he's going to be able to do that post snap. I haven't seen it in college and it worries me because if he's got 61 starts, are you going to expect him to learn a lot and develop a lot considering how much he's already played at the highest level of college football? That's scary to me. And it's not just that this offense was designed for yards after the catch. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But when you are number one in the nation in yards after the catch, the, I, I this number was before their Fiesta Bowl game. 2,886 uh, yards after the catch of their 4,455 receiving yards. That's 482 yards in front of second place UAB. So UAB had 2,404 in yards after the catch. UAB is not a very good football team. Oregon does not trust Bo Nix to do a lot of the high-level stuff. And it shows in the metrics. Now, yeah, let's talk more about the progressions. Like, you're doing a lot of half-field reads, a lot of, like, the quick game, as I talked about. But he doesn't see things with consistency. He doesn't, he's not going to be the kind of guy to look off the safety. He's not going to be the guy to really attack down the field. There, there are plays where he attacks down the field, but everything's on easy mode. It's like when you put in Madden and you put it on easy. And that's the easiest way to describe it. I, To me, there's not a lot of NFL quality stuff and a lot of stuff that translates. If you just want him to do quick game, sure. But even with NFL offenses, you have to do more than quick game. Because if you only do quick game, they're just going to bring those safeties up and they're going to clog a lot of those quick game lanes and you're just going to be toast. So there are elements to this. Um, I also don't like his footwork. I don't think he does well enough getting a sturdy base underneath him and getting it to where he can really drive the football. And I, I think because of some of that, his arm strength is just adequate. Um, I think it's capable on the intermediate levels, but there, I don't see a lot of great zip. I don't see a lot of being able to drive the ball to the outside. And when you encompass all of those things, I'm really worried about Bonix in the NFL. I'm worried about his pro prospects. And I really think if he's going to have any form of success, he needs to play with Kyle Shanahan and take over for Brock Purdy because Shanahan knows how to mask those things. And it with his creative genius, it doesn't matter. But it's going to matter pretty much everywhere else. And that's why I end up giving him a fourth round grade. As you can see, all my grading criteria there. 74.9, barely missed a third round grade. I just don't think he's a starting quarterback in the NFL. I don't. Um, I'm so worried he's about sort of like Daniel Jones. <sighs> yeah. I, I, I don't think that's a terrible comparison. Um, I don't really have a one-to-one -one comp, but if you're looking at a guy who can run quick game, have a little bit of element in the run game and be able to, do some of those things, but really can't elevate you or take you to another level. I think that's Bonix. And I, I honestly, I've graded seven quarterbacks so far. I'm probably going to have 10 to 12 graded by the time this whole thing is done. Nix is seven out of seven right now. 
I have him as my lowest ranked quarterback. Spencer Rattler, I have more questions about him um, on the mental side of thing, being able to see the field go full field reads, progressions, that kind of thing, and decision making. But Rattler's arm talent is far superior to Bonex. And to me, those the, it raises real questions. Like, I don't believe Nix is that guy. I just don't. And well, he's loved across the board by a bunch of other people that are scouting, PFF mm-hmm. being one of them. Yep. That, uh, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, people have him anywhere from the first round down to the fourth round, but mostly everybody's got him up there in that first, second round ish range. Yeah. I'm going to be honest. I, I, I can't speak for everybody. And somebody asked me this question in the mailbag and I answered it like this. I don't think they're contextualizing enough. And this is just my guess uh, for well, how the offense was structured the way it was. That's my belief on it. And I, I do, I do have a lot of respect for the people that have him ranked higher. Daniel Jeremiah just ranked him in the first round. Lance Zerline thinks he's a potential top 10 pick. Trevor Sikama really likes him. I don't, I really don't. And I would be, appalled if the Vikings ended up taking him and really tr- uh, put their future in his hands. Cause I just don't see it. I, I don't see it from any level. And the tough part is kind of, you look at the PFF grades and they're in the nineties, like that's in college and it's not projecting. If you wanted a college quarterback to run an offense, Bo Nix is going to be near the top of your list because he can do a lot of things that will, that can be, you can hide in the college game and you can maximize in the college game. The NFL is a different beast. And that's why a lot of successful college quarterbacks just don't translate. I think Bonix is one of those guys and I don't see him being able to take that next step. And if he does, I will gladly admit I'm wrong and say kudos, like good for you. I right now, based on the information we have, it's a firm no for me. And, but you are going to be able to see him next week. Yep, I'll be able to see him at the Senior Bowl. I'm sure he's going to be one of the more popular interviews because not only is he one of the top quarterbacks in this class, he also played at Auburn, which is not that far from Mobile. I think it's about an hour and a half, two hours worth of a drive. So there's going to be a lot of press. I was at the Super Bowl with Jalen Hurts, and Hurts, everybody was all over him. So I would expect excuse me, a similar treatment for Bo Nix. But for me, I'm out. I'm a hundred percent out. If you want to take a shot in round four or five, okay, but he's not going to be there. He's going to be long gone. Somebody's going to take this guy in round one or round two is my guess. Unless he just tanks the pre-draft process, which based on how his career has gone is not an impossibility because he's been very inconsistent. Like his first ever college start was he was an 18 year old true freshman against Oregon. He completed like 10 of 26 passes or something but he completed the game winner, which was a dime uh, down the field, like 13 seconds left. So there is positive to his game, but I don't think it translates nearly enough to warrant a selection for the Minnesota Vikings. I don't really think it warrants a selection for any NFL team in the first round. And Odie's looking at me like, yep, dad, I agree. Can we go get some treats now? (laughs) Well, it's going to be interesting if the Vikings select Bo Nix, if we hear that name. It, it will be interesting, and I will be uh, joining you in absolutely uh, obliterating this election because I just don't I don't see it. Um, and you know what? The one the interesting thing about this business, Dave, is you're wrong a lot. And mm-hmm. if I end up being wrong, I'll have to kind of just identify. Okay, maybe I just maybe there was growth, and I just never projected it because of so many different factors, and it just happens. Sometimes scouting is like that because you're it's an imperfect system it's very artistic and less concrete you can't just look at numbers and be like this guy's going to be great that's not how it works you have it there's an art to it and because of that art there's a lot of variables that you just can't pinpoint so if he ends up being good i'll eat crow but i i'll be honest i don't see it i don't see it at all well and we do know that some of the greatest quarterbacks that have ever played the game when they were coming out it's oh his foot works off this is wrong. Yep. That's wrong. Why are you taking him? This is bad. And then they turn out to be very, very good. So, who let, knows? Let's talk about 
let's talk about that real quick because I think one of the things really going against him, like let's look at JJ McCarthy. JJ McCarthy has, I believe, 28 starts in college football. He's 27 and one, or it's 29. He's 28 one. I can't remember, but he's got less than 30 starts. There's, and he's young. He's just turned 21 this past weekend. That's a heck of a lot different than a 23 year old who has 61 starts. You have a lot more things ingrained. You have a lot more habits learned. And when you look at all those factors, you take the younger guy because theoretically they have more room to grow and they have less of those bad habits. So if he was 21 and had like a similar start, but with the same profile, I think I might be more apt to bet on him, but it's just another piece to the puzzle that just is not in favor of Bo Nix. And that's why I'm out. Cool. What's the next goal search? We're going to talk about another quarterback that everybody really likes, and that is Jaden Daniels. And that's going to be a lot of fun. I do have the Drake May scouting report up on vikingswire.usatoday.com that you can go check out. And Caleb Williams will be coming soon. Until then, don't forget to check out everything we have on podcasts. We just passed 2,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel, so thank you very much. With that, there will be more skull searches in the Real Forno Show Wednesday night, 6.05 Central Time, and two old bloggers this Saturday at 4 p.m. Central Time. For Dave, I'm Tyler. Skull Vikings, baby. Skull Vikings. Like, subscribe, and ring the bell to get notifications. It helps us grow this community that we all love our Minnesota Vikings. And on behalf of Tyler Fornis and myself, Dave Stefano, thank you so dearly for watching The Real Forno Show. Skull, everyone. This has been a Vikings First and Skull production, part of the Fans First Sports Network.